I see that happening tonight. Oh my gosh, are we on? We are live. Hi, this yeah, is Nina. Hi, I'm about to wait my hands. 360 Metro here. 360 show with KMX, and we have a special, uh, it's a special show tonight. I'm going to do a very quick introduction. A uh, very quick a, introduction. We have, like a, a, we have a very who, who, special guest. We have a very special guest. So who, who's the guest that we have on? Uh, well, I no longer refer to him as Travis. Some about a Travis. He's Travis Parker. Barker of Philadelphia, because after research. Uh, after lots of research, I have just concluded that Travis Barker is actually the Chuck Treese of, of Los Angeles. Did you, Wait, do we have Chuck Treese coming in Yes, here? we actually have Chuck Treese. He's here. We're not worthy. We're not. No, no, no. I'm uh, not good. The reason being, and I just want to really quick just state, it's very, very important that we, um, that we had Chuck Treese. I've been wanting to have him on the show for a long time. But more and more, I've wanted him. It's, it's grown in, exponentially in terms of my desire to have him on. Not only to have an interview with him. But basically because almost every guest that we've had on our show, at least recently especially, have all talk about Chuck. We had with everybody from Supreme to Liana Mike to Baby Diaz. Mike Tyler, didn't he Mike say Mike Tyler, something? Mike Tyler. It seems that everybody that walks through our doors here at, at Trash Can Studios and we have on our show for 191 Live, at some point at, at some point the question is asked, where did it all begin? And almost every one of these artists from Philadelphia say, Well, I got my start with Chuck Trees. How could so many people? How could Liana? How could um? How could Supreme? Supreme's absolutely yeah. obsessed with Chuck Trees. How could okay with Liana? We have Jamie Tyler, we have Incognito. We never talked about. How could so many people have their start with the same person? If, the we're, if Philadelphia is Oz. Who's the real wizard? Who's the man <laughs> behind the curtain? And, I, I, I'm sorry, I got all this brown stuff on my nose. I know. Wipe I know. It. You gotta be careful. Oh, man, you smell. Wipe, the, yeah. 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 wipe that up my nose. I'm sorry. Oh, your food is here. Anyway, uh, awesome. so we're going to we're going to bring him in here because we are limited for time. And the one thing that's also especially cool about this person <laughs> is that he's so eclectic. He is a true Renaissance man in terms of his not just his musicianship. Uh, how many instruments? I don't know. We know how many plays we're going to find that out tonight. How He's many? Le uh, copy, how many patented pairs of sneakers? And, legendary uh, drummer, legendary guitarist, legendary songwriter. <laughs> but also, how about this one? Punk rocker. Punk rocker, and let's not forget, sort of a, a bit of a skateboarder, extreme professional extreme skateboarder sport, on top of that. Extreme and endorsed professional skateboarder. Um, who apparently he's got, what, he got a new lot of uh, mittens? We're not worthy, we're not what? No. Uh, All right, we're going to cue to a video of Supreme and the New Experience, uh, a video that I was there uh, the recording of at the uh, uh, World Cafe Live, and with yours truly on drums, and we'll be right back with Chuck Streets here at Studio 191 at the Trash Can. Hit it.
KMX here at Studio 191 at the Trash Can. And uh, yeah, Kevin, did you get all the brown off your nose? Uh, I think it's inevitable when you have a nose as long as mine. It's just going to become permanent. <laughs> it's just going to become permanent. Okay. So we're, we're just going to have to keep this thing rolling. Now, Chuck, yes. before the days of being a professional musician, yes. you did something else that a lot of people would like to do professionally, especially in Narberth. Mm -hmm. You were a skateboardist, yeah. or a skateboarder. Now, again, there are a lot of skateboardists and skateboarders, mm, right. but you were actually making a living skateboarding as of the the, the early '80s. Is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, I just I, I stepped on my skateboard at age 13, and then I never stepped off of it. So when I moved to Philly in '82 after graduating, you know, high school in Delaware, I just came up and met up with this guy Zeke Zagar and his father's Isaiah Zagar who's a huge artist in Philly and so Zeke and I skated Cherry Hill Skate Park together and then we started McGrad. Zeke was 14 I was 19 and so uh, we just kept skating and building this underground punk rock reggae scene that we loved in Philly you know because we were around a bunch of artists they weren't mm -hmm. just musicians they were guys who were like in bands but they were like really good graphic designers and really good film you know, people and really good photographers. and So we were all in this whole Rodman Street, South Street. Julia and Isaiah Zagar basically created, like, for me, and along with the Snydermans, connected the arts on the South, on South Street, and that's how we grew up. Just, we put out a record, their parents put it in the front store, so we mm -hmm. had to, we got a chance to learn how to promote ourselves, so that's why I was able to take skateboarding and, and make something out of it, because I was watching an artist, you know, Isaiah and his family do the same thing. So, mm -hmm. so this is so that you, you were a pro skateboarder during this period. Is that pretty much like your your primary job, like for for all? Well, those? I was I started out amateur and then I turned pro, and at that time, they weren't really paying out that much money. It was yeah. just enough to get, you know, you know, get a get a flight, to, you know, to the West Coast and get out there and hook up. You know, you always got free gear and. Mm -hmm. You know, perks of just, you know, what still goes on in skateboarding now. There's a little bit more money, you know, per se, but it's still the same thing. It's like you have to get out there and make friends and make connections. And, yeah. and that's more or less what our pro status was. We took it from the 70s and kind of early 80s when the parks were open and then they shut down. And then we were just left to like, you know, just a number of us, like 10 of us that just skated, skated in Philly alone. So we just kind of built it. You know, from Philly to New Jersey to New York, and then like further down south, and then we started fanzines that went from East Coast to West Coast and Midwest to East Coast and down. You know, it's just it's a big, you know, Shepherd. All those guys came out of that punk rock yeah. energy. You know, so and then doing this, so then also on the side, <coughs> that's when you you, you formed McRad. 
Yes. And you guys put out uh, one album during that period. I forget the name of it. Well, we put out Dominant Force, which is kind of like a EP album mm -hmm. EP. Um, before Dominant Force, we put out uh, Get Off Our Backs, which is uh, a compilation uh, Red Records have put out of like all the different bands that we kind of grew up with, and mm -hmm. we were kind of the younger band. There were Bunny Drums was on that. Uh, they had been on that record. Uh, Room was on that record. Why Die was on that record. So all the all the Philly bands that were playing Eastside Club and Love Hall, that, you know, the original Philly punk rock scene, uh, it was kind mm -hmm. of crazy. Right. So then it's a, it's around uh, 1990. That's when you, I wouldn't say retired, or re 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 retirement's always a, a weird word, but that's around the time you sort of left professional skateboarding. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. The, the whole game had changed by that point, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it was just, it's a different thing of what comes through. I mean, I could have easily just said, well, you know, music is just my passion, and then just get a job working for a skateboard company, which is a lot of people do, they become team manager and mm -hmm. do this and that, and still actively get out there because you're, you're going to skate events, you know, which I still do now. Right. But it was since I had grown up playing music, I had options to go out and tour. And that's when things like, you know, playing for the Bad Brains would come through or Urge Overkill or a bunch of different other bands, the Goats, you know, mm -hmm. Disposable Heroes. So, so that's able, so, so that's what, what, what starts happening around the, the early 90s when you, yeah. were, you, you were able to focus more on, on music. Yes. You weren't doing this. Do you ever think about becoming, in the meantime, a like skateboard, maybe a professional, professional tricyclist or unicyclist? You think that? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for coughing. Because I tried doing that pretty much around the same time you were doing that. You know, I was like, I, I, I was, I was just learning how to ride a regular biker around this time, and then I'm th instead I'm thinking, wait a minute, what if I stuck with my tricycle, but I just did it up? But I guess that there, there wasn't really an opportunity in that. So instead of becoming, instead of staying uh, uh, as a pro skateboardist, we're going to become a professional tricyclist or yes. unicyclist. Right. That's right around the time you started. Uh, pl you started focusing more on music. So go with this. You were playing with uh, the the Bad Brains. You first auditioned as as a vocalist. Yeah. And then, then then I got asked back to play drums. You know, mm -hmm. that. And in between doing dealing with the Bad Brains, I was playing guitar for Underdog. I mean, we did a record together called Vanishing mm -hmm. Point, which I played the leads on and stuff like that. And so that's a, Underdog was a big New York band, right? Kind of like did its own thing, and so. And Bad Brains, one of the first hardcore bands. This is around the time they were signed to a major label. Yeah, right? Epic. Yeah, Epic. So this is, I think they put out what was it? Got Gotta Love later on. This is right before that. Yeah, this is called Rise. Yeah, it was like Rise came out in like around '94. They did. A tour for a year with Living Color, opening up for them with wow. Mackie playing drums, and Israel was the lead singer, not mm -hmm. HR. And and then once Mackie decided to go his way, then they called me and said, "Hey, we have a tour of Japan and some other tours of Europe and the American tour. Do you want to come on?" So they gave me five days to learn all the songs, and wow, I had to go at it pretty hardcore. It was, it was scary. <laughs> right. So, right. So it's around this time. So you you play with them, but really as a as a, a fill in status. Yes. And then you were working with uh, with the goats around this time, right? Yeah, the goats were like right, but a little bit before I when I started playing uh, with Bad Brains, because I started doing session work for Rough House. Uh, it was like like 89, 90. This is about the time you worked with Mike yeah. Tyler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're all about that. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so 89, 90, you yeah. worked work with Rough House Rough Records. House. And Rough House had signed the Goats, and the Goats were positioned as this live hip-hop band, which they were. Yeah. They weren't just doing things just the way typical hip-hop bands were. They were actually taking live instrumentation right. and sampling and looping. Yeah. And, and I, I, I remember, yeah. I remember the Goats back in, in the mid-90s. I remember when it seemed like uh, mo so many of my classmates no. were into them, where it was, you know, it was really looking like, a, around this time, it was really looking like, like they were going to take off, yeah. uh, sort of, beyond that, make it nationwide, which, which didn't quite happen, but you say that name around Philly to this day, right. people remember. Yeah, yeah, the Ghosts were a big venom. I mean, we sold out, you know, the truck, I mean, just yep. on our own, like, just no, I mean, mm -hmm. just no major, you know, push other than just us playing shows and my involvement with them was we played our first shows together with me playing with them I and mean, they had mm -hmm. done some parties but we had to start doing things because they were signed to Rough House and we had to yeah. get things together so they invited me to join the band and we started working things out and then we did a tour with this band called Consolidated. Okay. A band from uh, like uh, San Francisco area 
and we did it one month with them, and then I went on to do some other things, and then they kept going on and touring, and, mm -hmm. and then we joined back the forces again. So I've done about three or four different tours with the Ghosts. Okay, I see, because uh, the Ghosts, from what I understand, do they have, was their lineup in flux a lot? Well, I don't, I don't, it's, it's, I mean, it changed. I mean, the, the original lineup, which is me, Pierce, Derek, uh, EJ, and then the, the Rhymers, which are, they, they never really changed, and Sean, um, the D, you know, DJ, actually uh, Sean. That, that clique of musicians stayed, we all played together for about three to four years, maybe five yeah. years. A and lot would, of people on that. We, we would interchange, like if EJ couldn't make it because he had another gig, then I would come in and play bass. If Derek couldn't make it, then I would switch and play drums. Or sometimes so it was always sort of fluid, the lineup. And yeah, the because everyone had different obligations. And, you know, when you get on a label and, and, and you, you your band becomes known, other people will start to take other gigs because work comes in. And if it's interesting, you're going to want to take it because you're a yeah. creative musician. You're creative people in general, but you, you, yeah. you don't want to just, like, be stagnant. And, and that's one, the one thing I did like about the GOATs is the fact that we could interchange, you know, exchange members and it would still be a good show. You know? Right. Now, yeah. now, not long after that, they said that the GOATs didn't really uh, make it internationally, but not long after that, the Roots, another like a live hip hop group, right. they came in and they, you know, ended up, uh, they, they ended up getting a couple gold records. Yeah. They ended up becoming, you know, an, a big international success. You think maybe that the, 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 the Goats helped really pave the way for well, the for Roots? For sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Because like, the, the Goats were the first hip hop band out of Philadelphia mm -hmm. with live instrumentation that was signed to a label and, and like a, you know, kind of like a indie to a major label because Rough House had a direct mm -hmm. pipeline with Columbia. So whatever would get, you know, promoted. The Fujis were on the same, in the same situation. They just had mm -hmm. something different. And I guess, you know, with Lord okay, Hill and like a wall studio for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So another thing that I do remember about the Goats is it was definitely, uh, I'm not, I'm no expert on them, but I just remember a very varied sound. Right. And there, I remember like uh, one song, for instance, this was a song that a lot of my classmates loved back in the day, Rumblefish. Yeah, Rumblefish is a which, great song. Yeah. And it sounded a lot like corn. That's yeah. sort of that, that, what they, what they, really? what, yeah, what they would call it, it would go on to be called like a uh, new metal, where right. it sounds that very like low, I don't know if that song was detuned, but it had that really low, yeah. bassy sound, that sort of boing yeah. rhythm that, that came out, it, it remind, and that sort of like a, uh, what it called like a dazed or maybe even like a the lackadaisical verse yeah. would sort of chill and then it gets into it like it's the same format that corn would uh, strike gold with right. and it came out the same time as corn's right. uh, uh, as corn's debut and I that's <laughs> wild yeah. of course now let's uh, now what happened with that sound later on got kind of right. <laughs> dragged them up more people came in it but I mean in, in the beginning that's when it was something that was very exciting like uh, how much did, did you play on on the records I, I played on the first record I'm on like one song I think it's Diggs Doug I think mm -hmm. I'm on on that one on the first record and then mm -hmm. on no Glo no goats no glory Guts, yeah. Guts. Um, I'm on a couple like one or two different tracks and there's one song called idiot business and and everything, but the whole th the whole sound of Rumblefish was basically when I when I first joined, it was like they were just more or less going for the hip hop thing, and I was just like, guys, we should just like play louder, play harder, play faster. And at that point, they didn't know who the Bad Brains were, you know. They were just kind of like, I think the drummer knew Derek, but the rest of the guys didn't. And they went on tour with them, and then they said, oh, uh -huh. you know, I can play hard and still have right. groove. And then we just started developing this sound, and so Rumblefish and you know, idiot business, and uh, there's like uh, skits and schizo was the song that, that we had on like a little EP. All that stuff started coming out of because we realized if we're going to be playing bigger venues, you have to put some kind of element of rock and roll into your show. Yeah, it's just it's necessary regardless of what whatever music you're doing. Yeah. Rock, rock and roll has to be there. It's and then I remember like uh, this is back in. In '95, I was graduating from middle school, and the reason why I want to bring it up because there was a middle school talent show that year. I remember one band, you know, they get up and they did Rumblefish. Wow! Right around that time. Now I don't. I, I could probably get in touch with them and maybe see if I can get them all to, to reform and open for you <laughs> next time you do a gig. They had they had to do everything exactly the way they did it in '95, which I think actually it's probably better off that you guys didn't hear them. Well, no, I'm just kidding. It was, you know, it was a cool, it's a nice high octane cover, but uh, again. When, when you hear the real thing, that's uh, 
That's something else. So anyway, uh, later on, but uh, the, the, as uh, just in, in the early '90s, that's when your your career hit a, a, a real milestone, and that's uh, with a certain when, when when you got on a certain Billy Joel song. <laughs> yes. And they, that when you funny. you played session bass. Yeah. With Billy Joel. So uh, I guess the real question uh, question is, how, how did you land that one? Um, well, once again, it's, it's basically through the whole connection of Studio 4, which is yeah. right on, um, like on 3rd Street um, in Philadelphia. Was. It, it was the original place where I basically, I met Jay Davison in California. He's a sax player for Philadelphia. He was playing for Cinderella and I, just, we were both at a video shoot together. He was actually in the band in the video and I was in the video also as an extra. And so we started talking because I have just finished my record with Caroline Records and I was moving back to Philly. So he was like, hey, come down to the studio, I'll introduce you to everyone. Mm -hmm. And so I go down to the studio, he introduces me from some guys from the Hooters and Joe Niccolo, Phil Niccolo, all these different Shout people. Phil. And then mm -hmm. I, yeah, and then I start doing session work and all of a sudden I get this call, I was like, oh, we got this track. It's a Billy Joel song, it's a remix. Can you, we need you to come down here. So I just bought this five string Epiphone bass, mm -hmm. for, you know, in South Philly. I just, Bought it for like 300 bucks and I just went in and they were like, all right, we just need you to play a very simplistic line over this thing. It's a remix. Because basically what happened was Billy Joel was in a situation where he was managed from somebody by someone and then that manager just embezzled a bunch of money. and like, uh, Destroyed him, dude. Like, yeah, it was, his, it was his brother-in-law. Yeah. yeah, I remember hearing about him. that. He had to do a, a stadium tour with Elton John to make that money back. That's yeah, what. so basically he had to do... He was cutting a record in New York, he was cutting a record in L.A., basically just utilizing the time of just, you know, capturing everything. And then all of a sudden, Joe and Phil Nicola were doing a bunch of remixes for everything that was coming through, you know, Columbia. And that remix that we were recording ended up being the title track of the record. And before they were just going to release it as a B-side. How dare someone's phone rings. <laughs> yeah. During this, but uh, so 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 that this is mine too, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, this so this uh, this yeah. How how important do you think you? Oh, I think my my phone's vibrating now. <laughs> so so so, so it's all yeah. vibrate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so anyways, yeah. So you did the the, the 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 remix of this single. Yeah, and that remix was it slotted. It turned out instead of it being a remix, it was the title track of the record mm -hmm. because of the work that we put into it. Myself was on it. Mike Tyler. Mm -hmm. Uh, Andy Kravitz, Jay Davison, Randy Canner. I mean, it was like the, the whole, we called ourselves the A team, and you know, Jeff Lee Johnson was on it, but it, it was just crazy how many great musicians were on that track. And when we knew that we had a chance to make something monumental because of this Billy Joel, and the song was mm -hmm. kind of like a, like a spiritual, a gospel spiritual. Yeah. It was easy for me to just lock into it because I knew that the pre-production and what they were going into. Yeah. I mean, they put a lot of work into it, and we. And you got your start, you know, playing playing in hardcore bands. Okay. By this point in time, you're doing like a gospel pop, like it's sort of like a, <laughs> a, a, a complete like a complete turnaround in the career. But it's something that that that, that for you, yeah. man, it, it, you, you just lock like you said, you just lock right into it. Yeah, it was great. And so this became the uh, the the main version. Yes. Of the song, this was the hit. This is if you go this, on YouTube right now, plug that in. This yes, is the that's it. Yeah, you're playing behind that video. Yeah, so this yeah, like is, I'm playing the bass. Yep, yeah, on it. And actually, Billy Joe wasn't even actually in the studio. It was all we just got the track sent to us because normally when they send someone a remix, they just send you know mm -hmm. the audio and then you basically have to revamp the song. And sometimes it's you know the different version, you know, they like it and then they go with mm -hmm. it. So that's basically what it was because we were always doing remixes. We were always yeah. recording live in the studio with great gear, great engineers, great, you Was know, this mostly digital or was all this all tape? All tape. All no, tape. Mm -hmm. As I say, yeah, that's right, they're 993, so we're talking amazing. like, uh, yeah. yep. All well, tape. What would they do? Would they, would they literally FedEx, UPS, or carrier yeah, over they probably large would just reels like, and they, shit? Yeah, but they was like uh, mailing the reels of, of, oh of tape and then they would basically you know, put it on the studer, and then they would, you know, make either probably a bounce of just the vocal and every and everything else, oh, and then shit. like take those master tapes and put them somewhere else, and then restripe tape again, and you know, either bounce them back so they can go in and start tracking. Mm -hmm. But we tracked it on the SSL board, which is a, a totally kick-ass board, yeah. you know, just and I take, and Chuck. I take it now you've done it digitally. You share tracks digitally with yeah, people. oh yeah, so all the time. It's yeah. amazing within what 
because this Billy Joel project ninety two, ninety three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pro Tools was sort of in like a beta stage back then, mm -hmm. I think. Beta I max stage. Ten, yeah, yeah, but you, look at, you, you probably look with you could probably see within ten years because you're hands on with the whole right. industry. Like yeah. ninety three, they're they're FedEx and giant reels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two thousand three, you're sending a, a, an email you're out. Emailing. Crazy. <laughs> it's it's crazy. crazy. Ten years. I know. Ten years, and it, and it all switched up like that. And the crazy thing is going to get even crazier with touch screen because. Somebody from Verizon was actually working on um, a place where I was living up in Bucks. We had like a like a lightning storm and the power mm -hmm. went out and the internet went down. And so we're getting it back up and the guy was like, okay, I'm going to help you out, but I'm going to operate your computer from my end. Mm -hmm. And he was able to basically go on my screen and operate it from his point, his, where he was sitting. So if, if that's the case, well, everyone will have that option. Then you can be able to go on and edit you know, virtually anywhere if you're working with someone, you know, mm -hmm. recording wise, because sharing files is one thing, but to be able to edit on the yeah. spot if you get an idea, if you're working on something, that's just priceless because, you know, things are, things do happen at lightning speed when you're in a recording studio. Right. That's why there's just so much to, yeah. now, to do it. Now, now, from there, from, from that point on, that's, uh, Pretty pretty much uh, ha haven't looked back as f as far as like a <laughs> like who who have like I know you've, you've worked with Pearl Jam. Well, you know what we're writing for we're short on time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I'm going to interject my producer Big Mouth self, and I want to just get number one. If Chuck could be kind enough to just give us a good a good just a rundown of, of people of, just a, of people you've worked with. Okay. I just want—I want you to brag. We're making you brag about yourself for once. People don't know. People who still have yeah, like, kind of who are some still low profile. You like some, 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 some big names. Yeah, like, good. you ever work with Justin Bieber or Justin like Chris give, Cross? Give us a good rundown, and then I want to know what you're doing right now. Um, okay. I want to hear about Liv. I want to hear about uh, Team Spaz yeah, okay. and about um, that movie. What's next? And also a little bit about the Lemonhead. So go ahead. Okay. Shoot. So I'll start with uh, Olivia. Um, Olivia and I are going to be working on new music. Um, we spent a year together writing in Bucks County and doing shows and it was something that she wanted to do and she was actually here with Supreme, you know, once. Yeah, and a few times. Yeah, so now uh, Olivia is working in uh, New York City for a magazine called Manhattan, mm -hmm. um, or The Manhattan. And is she digging it? She's loving it. She's loving it? Yeah, she's loving it. She must be loving it. It's a new it. job and it's a new career for her and she likes that. And, and it's good, and I love working with Liv. I mean, we're more family. I got to know her family. She knows my family. She's so sweet. It's, it's in. Um, the Lemonheads, it was great working with Evan. We did 14 weeks of touring, nine yeah, was in the States, five was in uh, you know, Europe. Evan's a great songwriter. I miss hearing him sing. It's not that he's, he's still alive. It's just, he's off touring and doing things again. He's How just, quick did they hit you with that, like, hey, come tour with us? Was that like something uh, we had about a, We had about a week to learn about 20 songs, not even, I mean, we wow. had two rehearsals and then we had one rehearsal with Evan and then we went, you know, on tour and then we had to switch bass players. That guy who was actually doing front of house sound for the American tour actually played bass on the European tour. What did you do for, you played? I played drums. Of course. Yeah. Well, actually I followed you on that tour I mean, a little bit. Um, <laughs> your little notes, you were so kind to put, keep putting them up. Because we right. missed you at the Job Inc. show um, where we had Liv and yeah, um, right. Scream. Um, so uh, what is what is next for what are you what are you involved with right now? What I'm involved with right now is I bought a, a sample of this sneaker that's coming yeah. out. Oh, you we get sneakers. Here, hold those up. We got it. And um, it's I my care. Nike sneaker. That's so bad. How, how did you get the Nike? Is this through the unicycle tricycle thing? Yes, yeah, for skateboarding, skateboarding unicycle chickens. Old school um, skateboarding. Of whatever skateboarding. Yeah, eighty four and eighty six basically. 84 is when McGrath, the first version of McGrath, that was, we broke up. Mm -hmm. And then 86 is when we released Absence of Sanity and Weakness was on that record. And Weakness is kind of a skate anthem in the skateboard world. We were on a label called Abs uh, Beware Records. The label's, uh, the record's called Absence of Sanity. And Stacy put Weakness and uh, McShred into public domain and that spawned this whole connection with skateboarding and music. They called it skate rock. So what oh, those kicks. You know, I talked to uh, my friend Jurgen over in Germany. And oh my he, God, Jurgen Germany? Is he a journalist? He worked. At, no, no, he's okay. uh, <laughs> graphic designer. So he worked for Nike, doing a Nike bunch of SB here. Dunk releases. He said he had a connection. We emailed Kevin at Nike, and they, you know, went through the ideas of, you know, getting it done, and it, it worked. 
So it's been a year in the making, and they'll be in stores in January everywhere. So thank you, Nike. Thank you, Jurgen. There Nike. we go. Right. So it's sort of like a professional. You can smile at those. Probably get the flash working. You think those will outdo the Air Jordans in popularity? I don't know. <laughs> you walk up to Michael Jordan and be like, hey, oh, you think you're cool? <laughs> well, Kobe Bryant, he's a good local celebrity. Oh, you think you're cool? You got your sneak? <laughs> I got these, chum. I could say that to him. And you then want to break some ankles, <laughs> get you a pair of treases. Get you a pair of treases. What are those called? What are those officially called? Those are it's called. A nice, it was a Nike SB dunk, the McGrath dunk. Or, you know, oh, we got to make rad on it. That's so, so fucking rad. Yeah, it says Mick. It says Mick, Mick right here. Oh no way! And then rad. Did right I hear the guy playing bass the other night for Mick Rad as part of the day? He plays with Dead Milk Men as well. Uh, yeah. Um, Dan. Who is that? Because I he did not look familiar to me for some Dan reason. Dan Stevens. Um, basically, I was doing a session with Dan over at uh, Milk Boy, which is the old Larry, mm -hmm. Larry Gold studio. Yeah. And. I forget the name of the artist we were playing for, but uh, Dan was in playing bass, I was playing drums, and, and then we started emailing, and he was like, hey, I just want to get out and do more work and do other things, and so I just started inviting him around, and he's also been playing with this guy, Mike Pinto, who's an you know, artist in Philly, so, familiar. you know, Dan's great, he's a great bass player, a good guy, and, you know, it's Dead Milkman are like, you know, friends, and, <laughs> you know, musical heroes. They're and, like the big lizard in the backyard. <laughs> um, so anyway, I just I just find it so interesting. You've done so many things, and I do have footage that I've not put up yet from that show the other night. But I wasn't allowed to bring my camera. I still have my cell phone. Right. And, then, <laughs> but, and what I can do is, like, if you want an extensive, uh, an exact list of people that I've played with, I can either email that where you guys can post it, or I can scroll through it. Or, or just spell it off right now. Be like, he still won't do it. Chuck, okay. hey, hey, Chuck so, you know what they're going to do? We're going we're gonna to get that huge list, and we're going to scroll through the credits to the Benny Hill theme music. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it, man. Right, you got it, definitely. You. We should no, put like, him on a pogo stick. Can you yeah, pogo stick, by the way? Yeah, some of the importance. Can you can unicycle, you but he can pogo stick? Can you pogo stick? Nah, I, I've tried Damn. it a little bit. Joe Jordy really. can pogo stick. I mean, I, I used to pogo when I went to punk rock shows as like a youth, but that's a, that's how. Would you like to try pogo stick? I don't know if I could try it now. <laughs> pogo stick means the unicycle. You have the bouncing. Uh... Would that be cool? Get check yourself a pogo stick in the backyard. Like to be a tox one to the fire pit. Right. Pogo, but no, okay, but no. So so people that are of importance. For me, um, but we're gonna Ben Hill it. But go ahead. <laughs> but go ahead. Just, uh, just talk about about ten or whatever. You have ten seconds. Uh, go ahead. The first one was Timmy, uh, Timmy Dredd from Timmy and the Dub Warriors, who I learned how to play reggae from in Philly. He was the first person I ever played reggae music with in North Philly. Him and Tristan. So thank you for that. Um, it went from there to jamming with guys from like Toxic Reasons and goofing around in the punk rock scene. Then, you know, playing drums for Bad Brains and playing bass for Teddy Pendergrass and Jim with Bunny Sigler, uh, you know, who's a huge Philadelphia person, a big songwriter. Uh, I've played live a uh, live show with Billy Paul. I've done stuff with T.M. Stevens. Uh, I've also done some stuff out at NAMM with Will Lee. Uh, played with The Roots, played with D'Angelo. Uh, playing guitar, playing with uh, Pearl Jam, jamming with those guys on a Green River tribute, Urge Overkill, Disposable Heroes, uh, The Goats. Jeez, hey. man. Lot. There's a lot. Uh, yeah. 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 So Let me ask you, who is, who is um, Ray... Um, oh, sorry. Asante too, Santo Gold, because we had a band called Stiffed. What about Cannibal Corpse? Who is Ray, Ray, um, Ray, <laughs> Ray Barbie? Yes, who is Ray Barbie? Ray Barbie is a musician, skateboarder from Long Beach, California. Ray and myself and Tommy and Matt have a band called Black Top. We're an instrumental skateboard group. Guys, all all awesome. pro skateboarders. Uh, we We're going to play a video for The me. record and a half. And we've done a couple of tours. Ray's a great... Ray and Tommy, and we all kind of grew up together out of the whole kind of like Mike Watt phase and like or an era of music. That's kind of how we connect. I mean, we connect through skating, but we kind of connect to that like kind of artsy, eclectic musician. Hipster. 
thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we could be hipsters, but we've been in it a little bit longer than you know the, yeah. the, the, the say hipsters. I mean, we could we could be mod per se. Mod, mod. Kind of a renaissance, kind of a renaissance mod. I don't think you're wearing that hoodie to be ironic either. So. I mean, <laughs> I'm not gonna make fun of hipsters. No, you have to. I will be, not make know, fun of hipsters. It's not like a paraplegic wearing a real skateboard. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I will say the one thing about hipsters is the. When I knew that something around. was wrong is when we, I was in Brooklyn in a club and they were line dancing to a song and I was just like, oh, you got to be... F- and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the... Um, it wasn't country and I was just no, like, this is it, lame. It, it wasn't the... Uh, if it was country, I'd be like that. I'm, 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 I it wasn't the wobble. I might be it a hipster, wasn't a just I don't have any fashion wobble. sense. And it's, yeah, it's not like I don't, I don't, I, whatever thing... Hipster music is great. But oh, no, but electric me, slide, like, come on, Chuck, just do it. They were, uh, I couldn't handle it. I was like, this is, I mean, I used to watch my mom and her friends do the slide, and that was great. That was but this, wedding. For, for people line dancing that were, were too cool to be tongue in cheek, I was like, what about the, What about the, what about the wobble line dance, though? That kind of freaks me out. When Supreme showed me that, I was like, wait a minute, they're line dancing. That doesn't seem right. I don't know. I mean, I guess, it's the, a I mean, who's the queen of the wobble? We haven't found her yet. We're going to find her. I don't Do you know. Like her I, don't, shake? I don't. I don't know if she'll ever show up. I mean, I mean, it all depends. I mean, she may just show up at a show, or she. May, there, there may be a bunch of queens. It's going to be. Office. It's going to be an ongoing process. Yeah. and and I mean, to find the best queen. Yeah, in this world, a, a queen is enjoyed on both sides of the coin. So, <laughs> it's whoever is the Especially best the queen of the wobble. Yeah, Especially if you got googly eyes. So. <laughs> googly eyes. <laughs> googly. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to close out. I want to thank Shock so much for being here. Thank I know you, you guys still have to get to work, yeah. and I want you to be able to take your food with you at least, or at least be able to try to have uh, inhale it real quick. We're going to Betty Hill. Your credits, and I just want to thank you for being here. Where can we see you play next locally? Um, we're doing something on the Rob. Leave his show, but that's not you know what I mean. Oh, no, no, oh, you have another Benny Hill that's don't coming. Even, <laughs> don't right. even go there, I'll not but, um, but um, sure. I think the next time we're actually playing is we're going to be doing something in January because you know we're right in the middle of like the holiday mm-hmm. thing, and everybody right now yeah. is pretty much family gifted because of our age mm-hmm. and things to do. Speaking of such, is it true that you uh, um, are you engaged? Um, I, have, I, have, I, I, can, I can clear, I can clear up the engage. I I am working on the the engagement, He's and I'm working. Work, so I think he just blew his spot up. I just no no no. I will. I'll, I'll, no, 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 it's not. It's just like we already went through this together. Uh, you don't yeah. understand. I was going to. I had it all planned no, out no, no, tonight. No, 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 she's watching this right now. She know. She know. She. It, it's it's no for for real. It's definitely no. I mean, this person is really special to me, so I'm just doing my best to make it all happen. You know what I mean? It's 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 something that's like really close to me. Yo, this is like totally new. Now it's a big mystery. Now it's gonna be like blah. And everybody's gonna want to know. Keep us updated. As there's a private life and everything. You are a great private person. That's why most people do well. not know. Just like all incredible things you've done, and that's the main purpose of me wanting you to be on the show. Is I wanted to toot your horn for you and just let everybody know. What an incredible human being you are! All the stuff you're doing and everything you've done and continue to and so much and brown stuff on our noses. Now mine's not brown. Now I'm being, being completely honest and I'm being completely authentic. I do want to we put, wipe we, that we, off your nose. We were going to put a half. Uh, we were going to put a um a, a, a half pipe in the backyard or whatever and and um, oh, we still should. And I invite Bam over and 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 to, and to calm an enemy except they can't skate. Did you know that? I don't think that y'all do that you can skate. They're all fat. <laughs> <laughs> they are not. I just saw the DRI. No, but seriously, I want to see you oh, skate. The, I'm dying to see that you skate. I've never seen you skate in person. All right, so, so Mar- March 1st, there's a show in Reading with uh, DRI, Common and Oh, Enemy my boys, we just saw them. We just saw them. So, yeah, that's that's the next one that's going to be that I know. Awesome. Well, is, it, that, is it that at the um, at, at Frank Robius place? Yeah, Frank is booking a new venue. So oh, a new venue? On top yeah. of the other one? I think so. I mean, I, no, I don't. Cause he, he, we were talking the other night at the uh, X show at uh, TLA, mm-hmm. and he's, uh, he's got some new, some some crazy different. Cause he's got that one too. Well, anyway, shout out to Frank Phobia. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm gonna do him for that measure. And so we can see you March first. You said, mm-hmm. and uh, we're we're gonna put up a uh, a listing of where we're gonna see you next. Uh, we're gonna place. Are we gonna be able to get McGrath on our show or what? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we'll, but we're gonna do that at the venue. We have a live studio audience, and you can blow it out. Okay. You, it's even they've got some cement floor there. You know, we can put some wheels on. So. Nice. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're wearing helmets. Dirt all around here. Don't wear a helmet. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and pa and knee pads. Skateboarders always wear knee pads. Yes, they do, especially if they're Kevin. Yes. One if they're gangsters. I'm trying. No, to I Kevin. shouldn't get on a skateboard. Period. No, you shouldn't. But we'll put you on roller skates. Uh, I'll see. I'll see about that. All right. Well, I like you at the basement. So oh yeah, this is nice welcome here. to the trash can. And the next party we have, where well, you're definitely invited. Of course, we usually have bonfire out back and everything, but this is a quiet night. So, anyway, uh, uh, did already a cheesesteak. You up for eating real quick? Oh, I don't. I don't eat meat. So. Oh, we got cheese pizza. No meat. No, I don't even eat cheese. Oh, he's. Oh, are, you a, are, you in <laughs> are you a vegan? Are you a vegan? No, vegan. I just I have a very strict diet. I have to keep. Well, this, that's why you're in good shape. Look at you. Yeah. That's what I need to do. So that's what I need to do. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's what Kevin. No more meat. No more cheese. No more Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Thanks a lot, Chuck. And we will Thank be listing your uh, your upcoming dates and your. Everything else. Uh, we broadcast through iTunes you know, on podcasts as well as we broadcast this video live on uh, Friday. It will be rebroadcast 8 p.m. All right. For 360 thank you live. For having me. And thank you, Chuck right. Trees. Yeah. Can we tell you? Oh, no, we're going to play a video yeah. quick. Uh, Ray pleasure. Barbie uh, Ray Barbie and Chuck Trees followed by McRad Weakness video. So we got two videos coming out of Chuck's queuing up. This is Chuck with Ray Barbie uh, uh, live. See video. Message